So, so, um, <coughs> so I'm, I'm supposed to, to be uh, providing the perspective of the human sciences or the human and social sciences, uh, including philosophy, into this discussion. First, I should note that there will probably be no major controversy here. I mean, I'm not going to, to deny any medical or biological facts about death or dying or about life for that matter. So uh, what I'm hoping to do is to provide some maybe philosophical perspective or, or to, to discuss some, some philosophical contexts or frameworks in, in which these, these matters may, may become uh, relevant and, and also may lead to different definitions. So just a couple of words as, uh, about the background of, of my own interest in this topic. We've had at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies, we've had an interdisciplinary so-called Argumenta project. It's, it's part of the funding scheme of the Finnish Cultural Foundation. Uh, so so that's, that's been a kind of an interdisciplinary uh, project with many people involved, uh, coordinated by all the Hakola who's actually here. And I, I've been leading this project. It's almost coming to, to its end now. Uh, of more events available, so check our website if you're interested in, in, in uh, what we've been doing within that project. Uh, so some conceptual preliminaries, sorry, sorry for the PowerPoint, I mean I don't have any fancy pictures, just words, typical philosophers PowerPoint, <laughs> in that sense, I'm sorry about that. Um, so we might of course uh, distinguish, uh, these are just some very basic <coughs> Uh, conceptual distinctions that, that may have to be made if we want to define death or talk about defining death. We need to uh, move on from the relatively vague concept of death itself that may refer to a phenomenon or a process, perhaps a, an event or even a state, to, to, to some uh, other concepts. Uh, we may talk about dying, of course, which is the process leading to death. And then, then uh, one question that would have to be discussed here would be when, when exactly that process begins, whether it begins already in birth. On the other hand, we just heard that you might actually die before you were born, so, so that's, uh, that's uh, also a problematic matter when, when that process actually begins. We know that all living creatures at some point die, uh, but then we could also uh, also define dying as, as something that happens after a certain, certain moment, kind of threshold moment, after which uh, there is no way of uh, preventing death anymore. Then we can talk about mortality. Of course, it's, it's a concept that is often used in a statistical sense, uh, but it, it can also be, be spoken about as, as a state or potentiality of living beings. Living beings are mortal. That, that is, they, they have the potentiality to die, and, and that potentiality will be actualized at some point. Um, and I suppose, uh, in, in some sense, the, the answer to the question whether we need to define life in order to define death would be positive. Of course, these concepts are very intimately intertwined, but uh, uh, at least insofar as, as we are seeking any sort of definition at all, I think we, we do need to, to consider both, but, but then I'm not at all sure that we could somehow define these concepts independently of each other. I'm very doubtful about that. Uh, furthermore, we could talk about the moment of death, which would then be some, some like, a, uh, uh, the, the dividing moment, uh, or the moment ending the process of dying. Uh, but this might actually be a temporally extended moment and would, would in fact have to be some kind of a process itself. So it's not clear that there, there is anything like the moment of death uh, that would be identifiable uh, in any real cases. Furthermore, being dead is, is something like a state of, of the being that, is, that has died. Uh, and, and again, we, we shouldn't say that inanimate beings are in such a state because they never lived. And one further distinction would be the one between death and, and something that is uh, sometimes called deathless annihilation. Uh, we might say that, for instance, in a case in which a bacteria 
uh, divides into to two or splits into, into two uh, different bacteria. Uh, the original one doesn't anymore exist after the division has taken place. Uh, it didn't die, but it's, it still it, it doesn't exist anymore. So, so there is a way of, even for living beings, uh, to, to cease to exist without actually dying, at least without dying in the same way in which we think of ourselves as eventually dying. So uh, I'm not saying that we would have to define all these concepts in any absolute precise manner in order to be able to define death. But, but uh, we have to have some kind of an understanding of these uh, conceptual distinctions in order to move on to this kind of a discussion. Furthermore, uh, there is the distinction between definition and criterion. This is something that Uskali already referred to in, in the opening remarks. A definition tells us what something is, or perhaps what something essential is. I'll get back to the topic of es essentialism in a moment. So, I, at least ideally, it, it, it provides us with the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to fall under the, the concept. Whereas a criterion is something different, it is, uh, it is something that we find useful uh, in enabling us to identify actual objects or cases or events falling under this concept that we're uh, applying here. So if we compare this to other philosophical uh, concepts or philosophical debates, uh, philosophers working on truth uh, often remind us that, that we need to be clear about the distinction between the definition of truth, which gives us the meaning of this concept, and the criteria of truths, uh, criteria of truth that can, that can be used in identifying truths. For instance, correspondence could be uh, the meaning of truth, even while coherence or some other criteria could be used in, in uh, identifying truths. And similarly, we could have, for instance, a biological definition of death as something like the permanent irreversible discontinuation of life processes or whatever along those lines, uh, while having some specific phenomena such as the termination of brain activity uh, used as, as the criteria by means we identify that a death has occurred. So, so this relates to the discussion of, of brain death uh, in, in uh, Anusavila's talk. And of course there, there is a large number of more specific definitions. Uh, for instance, if you, if you take a look at the recent Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy articles on, on death and the, and the definitions of death, you will find a lot of discussion of, of this and, and lots of references. Uh, so, so we might say that defining death is something like a conceptual or perhaps even ontological project or matter, whereas there is also this separable epistemological question or project of determining the occurrence of death. And these are two different matters, at least insofar as we find ontology and epistemology separable. I'm not sure if we eventually should uh, follow this line of thought, but I'm, I'm just sort of uh, bringing this up as, as a kind of a basic philosophical distinction. Of course, to say that these things are separable, or that there has to be a conceptual distinction along these lines, is not to say that they wouldn't be related. Obviously, whatever criterion we choose to use in, in this kind of a discussion, it, it should be somehow useful precisely for determining whether that given concept defined in some particular way uh, applies to an actual case. So, so certainly they are not completely uh, different matters, although, although technically separate. Uh, then, if we move on to this, to this discussion concerning the different perspectives that medicine, or more generally, uh, uh, biomedical uh, research and, and uh, humanistic uh, research uh, bring to, to this uh, debate, uh, I think when, when, we, when, when we approach this issue of defining it as as a kind of a uh, 
debate between different perspectives, medical and humanistic. Uh, this, uh, this debate has, insofar as there is any debate at all, it, it has its, its context in, in the more basic or broader philosophical opposition between naturalistic and humanistic approaches to the human condition generally. Or we might talk about philosophical anthropology, that is philosophical investigations uh, of what it means to be human. That's a phrase that is not so uh, popular nowadays. It's, um, most philosophers prefer to avoid such a phrase. Uh, and certainly I, I just uh, use it here in a very neutral sense, not, not, uh, not subscribing to any, any specific uh, doctrines in philosophical anthropology. Uh, now, one more distinction that needs to be taken up insofar as we, we uh, approach this matter uh, from the point of view of this uh, dialogue between medical and humanistic perspectives is the distinction between meaning and significance. In, in defining death, we of course are primarily interested in, in the meaning of this concept. Uh, in the question of what death is. But then uh, there is also something that we can call the, the, the question of significance, the, that is the human, cultural, perhaps existential significance of, of, of the phenomena or the uh, phenomena uh, invoked here. And, and this is also something that, that obviously philosophy and the other humanities ought to, to to discuss. Now, one, in my view, helpful way of, of investigating the different frameworks or contexts in which defining death may, may, uh, may be possible or, 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 or the contexts that, that may lead to different definitions or different ways of approaching this entire issue, uh, I find one, one helpful uh, approach in, uh, in, in a kind of a fourfold scheme of, of types of philosophical anthropology or philosophical approaches to the human being. I'm referring here to an old paper by one of our colleagues, Heike Conniston, on our retire. The younger generation here wouldn't probably know this old essay available only in Finnish uh, in, in, in the yearbook of the Philosophical Society of Finland, Ajatus. It's, uh, it's about the possibility of philosophical anthropology. And I'm, I'm sort of very briefly <coughs> hoping to use this fourfold scheme here. Uh, let me first say, however, that, uh, uh, that uh, if, we, uh, if, 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 we, uh, if we subscribe to, to one of these biological definitions, for instance, to to quote one of the recent encyclopedia articles, uh, uh, the definition of death as the irreversible cessation of organismic functioning, uh, or something like that. Uh, one of the questions, obviously, is if we if we want to con continue this dialogue between the medical and the humanistic perspectives, the question is whether this suffices for defining human death in particular, or whether we need some additional uh, definition such as the irreversible loss of personhood or something like that. Uh, this already leads to major complications because one could argue that to be human and to be a person are not the same thing. For instance, a fetus or even a stillborn child is certainly or wasn't certainly a person. It might have been potentially a person and so forth. There on the other hand, there could be non-human persons, uh, like maybe some animals or, or, or extraterrestrials, if there were any. And, and, uh, and, and obviously there are human beings who have lost person, or, or lost full person, at least. Uh, so, so this is a complicated matter. Uh, furthermore, going back to the distinction between a definition and a criterion, it, it might be entirely possible to propose a biomedical criterion or standard or whatever, uh, such as brain death suitably specified uh, for determining uh, the occurrence of death while still 
requiring that the definition of the concept itself uh, should be defined in a, in a broader way, including uh, also sociocultural dimensions. So that's why I think something like the typolo typology of philosophical ways of thinking about humanity more generally, plus about human death, is uh, helpful in, in this situation. Now, because of, because of some time pressure, I will have to move on very quickly, so, so I would uh, refer to the, to the readings and, and to the article that I mentioned uh, for further discussions of, of, of this. Anyway, essentialism is, of course, the classical way to start. This would be the first uh, type of philosophical approaches to the human being and also to, to death. Uh, on, on, on my four, uh, at least of four different approaches uh, derived from Conistus paper. So, so ideally, of course, a definition should provide the essence of the phenomena defined. And here again, we, we must distinguish between the essence of a human being in general and, and the essence of, of this phenomenon of death. Now, obviously, essentialism is a classical framework for thinking about uh, about what human beings are and what our death is or means for us. Uh, we, we can just think about Plato's, Aristotle's and other classical philosophers' theories of the human being and about the world generally. There is the idea of something like a teleological world order or somehow a normative structure, a cosmical order within which we, we have our own specific place. And now the worry, of course, here is that there may not be sufficient scientific grounding for such classical essentialist conceptions of, of humanity. Uh, so the second uh, possible approach, scientific naturalism, arises as a, as a denial of, uh, of some of the basic ideas of essentialism. Uh, there are just the objective natural facts about us uh, including facts about our biological uh, death uh, that apply to us as, as much as to any other biological uh, creatures. Uh, and, and naturalism in, in, in a broad sense is of course the starting point for any biomedical uh, ways of defining death. One philosophical worry here obviously as in, in, in all discussions of naturalism, which I won't be able to go into any, any details of here. Uh, one worry is, is reductionism. Uh, if we have a purely naturalistic approach, uh, the phenomenon of death may lose its, uh, what may be called its human <coughs> significance. So, uh, to, to move on to the third possible approach, uh, which may be called culturalism, uh, this, this would be something in which uh, the socio-cultural dimensions of, of, of human life generally and, and human deaths in particular would be emphasized. So, so, so here death would mean much more than a mere discontinuation of our biological activities. Although of course it's that too, there would be no point in denying that. Uh, we can and do talk about uh, the death of, of various cultural and social structures or formations such as languages, uh, sciences, maybe or religions, maybe, maybe nations, and so forth. Uh, we could say that uh, culturalism generally uh, re-establishes the kind of uh, normative structure that the original essentialism presupposed, but now, now conceives of this as something that is human-made instead of given to us. Uh, as many philosophers have, have put it, we in a way live in a symbolic cultural world in addition to living in a physical universe. There was one previous uh, eight session devoted to the topic of social ontology and, and, and this, this would obviously be a way to, to connect to, to that if we had any more time. One, one problem in culturalism is, is the threat of so-called cultural relativism. Uh, eventually the facts about uh, these uh, normative orders would just be further facts about the way in which we human beings in fact live in different societies. So, so this, this, this would also lead to problems. 
Finally, uh, I will I will basically skip existentialism here because it's not, not it, it may not be so close to our our topic. It's of course one of the major sources for 20th century and, and I suppose beyond uh, philosophy about human mortality and and, and death and dying as, as human phenomena. Uh, so I, I move on to, to some of the final uh, final remarks, uh, a few more slides. Uh, now, I think an interesting challenge for philosophy of death and mortality is to, to integrate some of the plausible aspects of these different rival types of philosophical anthropology that might also be seen as different or rival types of philosophical thanatology, if we want to, to use such a, such a phrase, although it's not, of course, not generally used. Uh, first, we may be unable to completely abandon the, the original classical quest for, for a definition that was inspired by essentialism. Although we have to take seriously whatever it is that the most advanced natural sciences uh, teach us about human life and death. Uh, we certainly cannot return to, to classical teleolo teleology or, or other essentialist ways of thinking, but, but on the other hand, uh, we should somehow maintain the, the idea of a culturally structured normative world order we sort of made ourselves. Whereas also fighting or, or at least challenging the, the reductive uh, tendencies of cultural relativism. So, so this is a, a matter of integrating some different uh, strengths of, of these different approaches. Now, one key point here, given our topic, is something like a synthesis of naturalism and culturalism. So, so if we want to have a genuine dialogue between the medical or biological approaches and, and, uh, and the humanistic or sociocultural ones, uh, on the other hand, we, we need to consider this broader project of, as I say, critically synthesizing naturalistic and culturalistic conceptions of humanity and conceptions of death. This is arguably essential <coughs> for the project, a continuation of the Kantian project of reconciling, or at least making compatible, the realms of nature and freedom. Of course, I, I won't be able to go into that in any, any historical detail. Uh, if I think of, of the kind of work that I've done myself in, in philosophy in, this, uh, in relation to this kind of issues, uh, the tradition that I've been working most on is, is the, the pragmatist tradition and, and, uh, and, and that I think might also offer a promising perspective to, to this kind of mediation between naturalism and culturalism, although uh, I, I will have to, uh, to, to skip skip uh, the further details about, about that here. So I move on to my final slide. Uh, one, uh, if we want to return to this, this question concerning definition or defining death, uh, one proposal here is that we might, we might think of death as, uh, as a family resemblance concept in, in Wittgenstein's sense that is uh, something that doesn't really have an essence because for instance, the deaths of, for instance, cells or human persons or perhaps biological species or perhaps more metaphorically of scientific theories or cultures or whatever are all quite different phenomena, yet they do seem to have something to do with each other. So they are not completely different either. So I don't think we should reduce the concept of death to biological concepts. I, if, if somebody proposed that we should reduce the concept of death to physical concepts, that would hardly even make sense because the entire distinction between life and death wouldn't be relevant there. So, so a, defin a physical definition of death would, uh, would already lose that, that distinction which would have to be presupposed in talking about death in the first place. So, so that kind of a reduction wouldn't make sense. Uh, the biological reduction probably would make sense, uh, but still it would uh, lose various cultural dimensions of death that we 
probably want to include in our concept of the other. So what I'm sort of proposing here is a kind of pragmatic pluralism. We may have different definitions. I mean, yes, we can certainly define it, and we can define it in many ways. And, and di these different definitions are, as definitions generally, useful or more or less useful for different human purposes. For instance, there are clearly legal needs for a definition of death, uh, and, and, and we, we may have different, uh, at least to some extent different, definitions in different contexts. Let's say legal, scientific, medical or clinical, maybe military, maybe theological, that would introduce yet another quite different perspective. All, all these would categorize the relevant phenomena or phenomena quite different. Yet they, they would have to have something to do with the, each other. And here uh, the purpose of philosophical uh, inquiry into, into this concept or related concepts would precisely be to somehow coordinate this interdisciplinary debate on, on, on the various possible definitions there are and, and perhaps also on, on the related criteria that might be used. So I don't think there is any purely philosophical purpose for defining death. Uh, I don't think there is a final philosophical truth about death available and I'm not sure if that's even a meaningful goal. I, I think of philosophy as, as playing this role of coordination. And, and for that reason, I also find the, the fourfold typology only very briefly uh, introduced here useful. So thank you very much.